Peace, love, All right. science. Gather around my children, pull up a chair, my friends. Let's all get together for the story that never ends. How did we get here? What's inside your head? What's bluer than blue? What's redder than red? Gather around my people, all children, young and old. Pull up a seat, put up your feet for the greatest story ever told. is knowledge and knowledge is power cause the world is so weird and weirdness is fun cause there's so much to learn and we've all just begun oh we can learn together we can understand the weather we can imagine ourselves in any place we can see the earth from outer space how do we do that? With science! Funky, funky science! Whoa, science, science! Funky, funky science! Whoa, funky, funky, funky science, yeah! Whoa, we can learn together, we can understand the weather, we can imagine ourselves in any place, we can see Earth from outer space, but how? Oh, with science, yeah, funky, funky science. Oh, I said with science, 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 funky, funky science. Oh, funky, funky, funky science, yeah. All right. Hi, Luis. Hi, Bonnie. Welcome to the Funky Science Story Hour, episode N plus one. Last week was episode N, so this is episode N plus one. All right. And um, there's a few things I want to talk about today. Um, I was going to do a little uh, demo of something something cool that we call feedback um, but before because feedback is one of those things that when you learn the concept you realize that it's all around you and everything you see is is doing feedback of one kind or another so it's one of these fun concepts that you learn and then you can look around your house or look around the world and go oh that's feedback that's positive feedback that's negative feedback I'm gonna explain about that in a few minutes but before that I just wanted to uh, get to a couple of questions that came in last time that we didn't quite get to. Um, oh, somebody said, hey, Funky Spoon. By the way, that's me. I'm David Grinspoon, your host for the Funky Science Story Hour. Um, I sometimes get called Dr. Funky Spoon, but um, it doesn't really matter what you call me. You can call me anything you want. In fact, I don't care because because I can't hear you. <laughs> Just don't call me late for supper. All right, um, you can call me that. Hey, hey, late for supper, answer the question. All right, the question is, uh, hey, Funky Spoon, what is your favorite, favorite object to look at with a backyard telescope? Ooh, good question. What is my favorite object to, hey, David, you rock, look into the camera more. Where is it, is it right here? <laughs> Oh, I'm looking. I don't see anything in there. Jen says, look into the camera more. I know, the, the, I was looking away because I got my little notes over here. But, oh, also, I see what the thing is, because I'm looking at the middle of the screen, but the camera's actually right here. So I should be looking there, because when I look over here, it looks like I'm looking away. This is fascinating. <laughs> I hope you're enjoying it as much as I am. So anyways, the question was, uh, what is your favorite object to look at in a backyard telescope? And the answer to me is, is obvious. There's one thing that 
pops right into my mind, and that is the planet Saturn, the giant ringed beauty of the solar system. Because, I mean, there's a lot of fun things to look look at in a telescope, and you can you know spend hours and years, um, as which people do, uh, looking at things in the night sky through a telescope and you'll never ever get bored because you always find something new and it's just fascinating but but if I had to pick one thing it's the planet Saturn because uh, the first time you see Saturn through a telescope it blows your mind it blows your mind because you know you've seen the pictures and you've seen the drawings there's the planet and there's the rings around it you know what Saturn looks like but if you and I'm sure some of you have seen it in a telescope but if you haven't the first time you see it it just it doesn't look real it's like um, it, it's like something so fantastic because it looks three-dimensional because it's not just like the cartoon where you see the planet and the rings but it, it, you can see it's, it's usually tilted in some way and you can see the shadow of the rings on the planet of the on the clouds of Saturn sometimes you can see the shadow of plant of, of Saturn the planet on the rings and it looks so three-dimensional it's like you could reach out and touch it and you go oh my god that is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen and I can't believe I'm seeing it like this so um, if you haven't ever seen uh, hey Sasha hey Danny if you haven't ever seen Saturn through a telescope um, you you should find a way to and a lot of times even if you don't have your own telescope if you a lot of times local um, observatories and planetariums and amateur astronomer groups they have nights where you can go and look through a telescope so it's not that hard to find actually there's, it's funny there's several questions about Saturn Ooh, this one is cool my name is Avia 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 I am nine years old from Miami hey there Avia I hope I'm saying your name correctly and the question is, I have a question. I want to know if in Saturn they have seasons like summer, fall, spring, and winter. That's a great question. That's a really great question. Do they have seasons on Saturn? And, um, and the answer is definitely yes. And they're somewhat similar to the seasons on Earth. Um, and they happen for the same reason. Do you know why we have seasons on Earth? I mean, summer, fall winter, spring, it's because uh, as the Earth orbits the Sun, this is the Sun, this is the Earth, the Earth is spinning on its axis, but that axis is tilted, actually let me grab a planet here, there's some planets over here. This is Mars, but it will work for our demonstration. So, here this planet is spinning on its axis, right? And if the sun is over here, then the sun's rising and setting. If you're, if you're standing, say you're standing here, and say this is the Earth, and you're standing here, and the sun is here, then as the Earth spins, when you're here, it's rises. you see the sun rising, and when you're here, you see the sun setting because it's going away from your view. Now, that axis, the imaginary line that the, the planet, in this case we're pretending this is the Earth, even though it's Mars, that imaginary line that the Earth is spinning around is tilted. The planet is tilted over by about 23 degrees. Do you know what I mean when I say an angle of 23 degrees? If you go all the way over like that, all the way over on your side, that's 90 degrees. 90 degrees. 90 degrees. If you do half that, it's 45 degrees. So 23 degrees is about half of that again. So it's about like that. So the Earth's axis is tilted about 23 degrees. And that means that at different times of year, the sun will shine more on the south 
or more on the north. Right now, if, if the sun is over here and the earth is here, then it's shining more on the south. So that would be summer in the south, summer in Australia, and it would be winter in the north, winter in, in, in the US because of that tilt. But if, if you go six months, six months later, so you're half a year later, and that tilt stays the same, but now the planet is on the other side of the sun. So here's the sun, and that tilt stayed the same. So now look, now the north part of the earth is facing more towards the sun. So there's more sun in the north and less sun in the south. So that's summer in the north and winter in the south. So it's because the earth is tilted and as it orbits around the sun in a year, 12 months, that tilt means that for part of the year more sun's falling on the north and it's summer there and winter in the south and for part of the year more sun is falling on the south and it's summer there and winter in the north. You probably already knew that. That's why we have seasons on planets that, that are tilted. And most planets are tilted. Their axis is tilted. So most planets have seasons to some degree. Not all planets. One of my favorite planets is the planet Venus and it's not really tilted. It also spins backwards. Venus is weird. Weird planet. But um, because of that, Venus does not have seasons. But Earth does, Mars does, and the question was, does Saturn have seasons? And the answer is yes, because Saturn, the axis of Saturn and the rings are tilted. Almost the same tilt as Earth. A little bit more. Saturn is tilted by 27 degrees. So as Saturn orbits around the Sun, Sometimes for half of that Saturn year, the north of Saturn is pointing more towards the sun, and for half of the Saturn year, the south of Saturn is pointed more towards the sun. So just like Earth, Saturn has summer, fall, winter, and spring. But here's the weird thing about Saturn. You remember last time I talked about how planets on the inside lane, planets closer to the sun orbit faster around the sun. And planets on the outside lane, planets farther from the sun, they orbit much slower. They take longer, many more days or years to go around the sun because they're farther out. The gravity from the sun, it's less strong, the pull, pulling them around their orbit. And when you get out to Saturn, Saturn has, um, oh, good question, Lauren. I'll try to get to that one. Saturn has a much longer year than Earth's year. Saturn takes about 30 of our years, 30 years to go around the sun once. So a year, one Saturn year takes 30 years, 30 Earth years. So however old you are now, so Lauren from Maine is seven years old. When Saturn goes through one year from now, Lauren will be 37 years old. So however old you are now, in one Saturn year, you're going to be 30 years older, which is kind of crazy. And as a result, the seasons last a long time. It will be summer on Saturn for, for um, well, about seven years, seven Earth years and then it'll be fall for about seven years. Seven of our years. Because <laughs> one, one Saturn year is, about, is almost 30 Earth years. It'll be winter for about seven years, a little bit longer. And then it'll be springtime for seven years. Can you imagine springtime for seven years? That sounds pretty great to me because it's springtime right now where I live and I'm digging the spring. Okay. Um, so, a great question, um, who, Avia, great question, Avia from Miami, nine years old, great question, there are seasons on Saturn, and they're long and slow. Lauren from Maine asked, seven years old, hi Lauren, asked, why does Venus spin backwards? I mentioned that most of the planets 
spin in the same way. And because Earth spins the way it does, you see the sun setting in the west and rising in the east every day when it's not cloudy. And not just the sun, but the planets and the stars, everything sets in the west and rises in the east because of the way the earth spins. But if earth spun the other way, it would be the opposite. Imagine if earth stopped spinning the way it spins and started spinning the other way. Then you would see, it would be very weird, but you would see the sun rise in the west and set in the east. And in fact, that is what happens on Venus. Venus spins backwards from the way the Earth spins. Um, and so if you could see the, sky, the, the sun on Venus, which you can't, you could never see the sun if you're on the surface of Venus. Do you remember why? We talked about that last time. Because Venus is cloudy all the time, everywhere. But if you could see the sun on Venus, it would be very strange because you would see it rise in the west and set in the east. The opposite of here because Venus rotates backwards from the other planets. The other strange thing about Venus is that it rotates really slowly. So if you wanted to, if you loved, if you could see the sunset on Venus and you loved the sunset on Venus, you could walk and keep pace with the spin of Venus. You could walk and keep the sunset going forever because it's just a few miles per hour, the spin of Venus, if you're on the surface. On Earth, you could keep the sunset going forever if you go up in a, in a jet plane and you go hundreds of miles per hour because that's how fast the spin is. I mean, it depends a little bit if you're at the equator, it's faster than if you're near the pole, but uh, it's very fast. On, on Venus, it's so slow you could walk and stay the same time of day forever. <laughs> but the question was, I'm not really evading your question, Lauren, I'm leading up to it. Why does Venus spin backwards? Maybe I was evading it a little bit, but it's one of these um, questions that you'll find that uh, happens a lot in science, certainly if scientists, if scientists are being honest, and the answer is, we don't know why Venus spins backwards. Um, we have some ideas. We got theories. You want theories? We got them. The, um, the best idea is that when Venus was a young planet, just forming, it got hit by something, by another small planet, which knocked it into its weird spin. That's not such a ridiculous idea if you know how planets formed, because what we've learned is that the planets formed Planets were born out of collisions of smaller, what we call planetesimals. Planetesimals, it means little planets. Little planets, planetesimals. Uh, when, when the uh, sun was born, there was just a cloud of dust and gas around the sun. There were no planets. But then that cloud of dust started uh, coagulating. Like, like, like when it snows, you see uh, stuff condensing. It was basically snowing around the young sun as it cooled off, but it snowed little bits of rock and metal, and those started to clump together into snowballs. And, uh, whoops, stay there, Mars. It started to uh, clump together, um, and those clumps smashed in and made bigger clumps and bigger clumps until you got planetesimals which were pretty big, like maybe a thousand miles across. And then those planetesimals kept smashing into each other and making even bigger things. And the biggest things, the things that were left standing in the end after all that smashing and colliding, those were the planets. So we know that the planets formed out of collisions. And we know, for example, that um, there was a big collision on our planet, on the Earth, when the Earth was young. And that's how we got the moon. If you were, were going to ask me, how did the moon form? I would say there was a giant collision when the Earth was young, and a bunch of Earth stuff got splashed off the Earth into a ring around the Earth. And then that ring coalesced by gravity and gathered together and formed the moon. So we know that the planets had a lot of collisions when they were young, and, and so it's reasonable to think that Venus had 
big collisions like that, and that's probably why Venus spins backward. But we're still looking for the evidence. We want to send more missions, spacecraft to Venus, and learn more about its origin and its early history. But that's, that's what we think right now is the best idea for why Venus spins backward, because it got hit by something. Oh, uh, I see um, Grayson is asking a question. Grayson wants to know, why is Mercury the second hottest planet when it's closer to the sun than Venus? That is a great question, Grayson. Man, okay. Um, I, love, I love this stuff. So, as you know, as you all probably know, the closest planet to the sun is Mercury, and then next out is Venus, and next out is Earth. And just roughly so you can picture it, if this is the sun and this is the distance to Earth, then um, Venus is about eh, three quarters of the way out from the sun to the Earth. So if this is Earth and this is the sun, Venus is here. And Mercury is roughly half that distance again. So Mercury's like eh, right there in front of my nose, okay? So Mercury's a lot closer to the sun than Venus. And the reason why in general planets are hotter closer to the sun is because they get more sunlight and the sun is the source of heat. So if everything was the same about Mercury and Venus and the Earth and all the other planets, if the, if the planets were all the same, then the ones closer to the sun would always be hotter because that's the source of the heat. So it's a strange fact, as Jason points out, that Mercury, even though it's the closest planet to the sun, is the second hottest on the surface and Venus is the hottest. And why is that? That's because of what we call the greenhouse effect. I talked about this a little bit last year because Venus has a very thick atmosphere, has air, lots and lots of air, much thicker than the Earth's. In fact, Venus is, is one of the thickest atmospheres, uh, depending on how you look at it, the thickest atmosphere in the solar system. Of any planet that has a rocky surface, Venus is by far the thickest atmosphere. And not only does Venus have a thick atmosphere, but that atmosphere is made up almost entirely of carbon dioxide, CO2. We talked about carbon dioxide last time, and carbon dioxide absorbs heat radiation. That is, it blocks heat radiation. So the sun is heating up all the planets, and in general, the ones that are closest to the sun get more heat from the sun and they're hotter. But Mercury has no atmosphere. So it doesn't have any greenhouse effect. It has no, nothing that's blocking that radiation, that heat radiation, what we call infrared radiation. Remember in the song, in, in the intro, the Funky Science theme song, I say, what's bluer than blue? What's redder than red? Well, what's redder than red actually is infrared radiation. If a, a color that's so long, I talked about the, the Blue light is the short wavelengths, the little nee, 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 wavelengths, and the red light are the boom, 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 the longer wavelengths. Well, if you go out to even longer wavelengths than that, you get to infrared light. Mm -hmm. Long wavelengths. Our eyes can't see it, but we know it's there. Our scientific instruments can detect infrared, and we can feel it. When you feel heat coming off of a stove or a fire or a, from the sun, you're feeling infrared radiation. And the planets, when they heat up, they're trying to get rid of their heat. They're radiating away infrared radiation. So Mercury is being heated from the sun, but there's no atmosphere blocking its heat radiation. It's infrared. So it's just sending a lot of heat back out into the universe. But Venus is a little bit farther from the sun than Mercury, but that sunlight comes in and heats it up, and then it's got that thick, carbon dioxide atmosphere which blocks the infrared, blocks that heat radiation and holds it in. And Venus has such a thick atmosphere and so much infrared that it's the hottest planet in the solar system, the hottest surface of any planet in the solar system, even though it's not the closest. So that's the answer um, to your question, Lauren. Thank you for the question. Great question. Oh, Elizabeth just asked Venus, is it like lying in a bed in bed with a blanket over you? Yes, because when you lie in bed, if you're cold and you pull that blanket up, that blanket is blocking your heat 
radiation. Um, it's it's also it's it's doing other things too. But it basically yes, it's basically like pulling a blanket over the uh, over you. Um, by the way, oh you're welcome. You're very welcome, Jess. Um, by the way, I thought I would say something about carbon dioxide and why it blocks heat radiation. Um, this relates to other stuff we've talked about. And, you know, um, I talked before, uh, two, two weeks ago, we talked about molecules, and molecules are the smallest things in the air. Uh, and there's oxygen, which you're breathing, and nitrogen, and then a little bit of carbon dioxide, but it's that little bit of carbon dioxide which is blocking all the heat. And you might ask, why is it that carbon dioxide molecules block the heat but oxygen and nitrogen molecules don't? This is an important question because it means that carbon dioxide is what we call a greenhouse gas. It heats up a planet. Whereas oxygen and nitrogen are not greenhouse gases. They don't heat up a planet. So the answer is, I'm going to draw a picture for you. Um, with, I'm going to use this, the magic um, high-tech graphics we have here that we used last week. So here's the surface of a planet, right? And here's the atmosphere. And the sun's up here, shining through that atmosphere. And that sunlight comes in, heats up the planet surface. But that visible light, we talked about visible light. Everything from blue, yellow, green, red, the light that you can see. That's what we call visible light. And the sun is putting out a lot of visible light heats up a planet, and then the planet, because it's hot, it's radiating what we call infrared radiation, which is that light you can't really see because it's redder than red, uh, but we know it's there. And if there's no atmosphere on the planet, like if it's mercury, that, they, that infrared can just radiate out into space, so the planet will get hot, but not too hot, because it can cool itself with that infrared radiation. But now let's say that planet has an atmosphere, like Earth, or a really thick atmosphere like Venus. Now that infrared, the, the, the sunlight comes in, heats up the surface of the planet the same way, and, that, and the planet tries to cool itself off, that infrared radiation, but it gets stopped by the atmosphere. And it heats up the atmosphere and it gets bounced around and then it gets, some of it gets bounced back down and heats up the surface some more. And it's basically trapped. The radiation gets trapped and the planet starts to heat up. Okay? But the question is, Here's my magic eraser. The question is, why do some gases block the... Oh, Jeremy, 38, says, are you left-handed? Me too. No, this thing is, everything's reversed. I'm right-handed, but it's making me look left-handed because of the weird reversal of the... Uh, great question, though, Jeremy. <laughs> um, the, um, why is it that some gases are greenhouse gases which stop radiation from going to space and other gases which are, are, don't, are not greenhouse gases. It has to do with the structure. So most of the gas in our atmosphere is nitrogen and oxygen. So the nitrogen, there's two, and we call it N2, N2, because there's two nitrogen atoms, these are both Ns, and there's a strong bond between them. We draw that as a triple bond, but don't worry about that. And that nitrogen, it's a very stiff molecule. It sits there, it vibrates a little, but it doesn't do much. Because it, that bond is very strong, it's very stiff. And oxygen, most of the other gas in our atmosphere, the stuff we breathe, is the same way. It's got two atoms. We call that, well, there's two oxygens. And that's a slightly different bond. We call that a double bond, not a triple bond. But it's the same thing. It's a very stiff molecule. It vibrates a little bit, it bends a little bit, but not much. It's pretty much just sitting there. So we call these molecules, each of these molecules has two atoms. The nitrogen has two nit nitrogen atoms. The oxygen molecule has two oxygen atoms. We call those diatomic. Diatomic. Because di means two. So diatomic, like, um, I'm trying to think of another word that has di that you would know. Um, I'm thinking of all these ridiculous words. Somebody, if somebody says one, then I'll see it. Um, but anyways, the, most of the gases 
in our atmosphere are diatomic. They have two, they're molecules with two atoms. And it turns out that infrared radiation passes right through those diatomic molecules. It doesn't even see them. It's just, um, the radiation is not blocked by those. So if you have a planet that's all these kinds of molecules, these are not greenhouse gases, the radiation passes right through them. It doesn't even see them. But, now let's draw a picture of carbon dioxide. You have a, a carbon atom and two oxygen atoms. So this is a triatomic atom. T-R-I, like a tricycle. Three. Triatomic. And because it's triatomic, it's a much more floppy molecule. It doesn't just sit there. It's doing all this stuff. It's like it's bending like that. The oxygens on the carbon are going it's vibrating, it's bending this way and this way and this way, stretch, bend, stretch, vibrate. Literally, if I was a diatomic molecule, like my head and my hand are two nitrogens, I would just be sitting there going like that. I can't move. I'm stiff. I'm like somebody that doesn't know how to dance. But if I'm a triatomic molecule like carbon dioxide, then, yeah, dioxide, two oxygen. Thank you, Bonnie. Carbon dioxide, two, two oxygens. So the whole thing is three atoms. It's triatomic. And that means I'm a floppy molecule, like this. I've got, uh, I can bend, I can stretch, I can vibrate all over the place. And that means when an infrared, some infrared comes along and it hits that, it starts it vibrating. It starts going like crazy. It stretches, it vibrates, and it absorbs that infrared. The energy gets taken out of the radiation and goes into making the molecule vibrate. So the bigger, floppier molecules, like carbon dioxide, and there's another one called methane, which is CH4, which if you draw a picture, is a carbon with four hydrogens. And that's another real floppy molecule. It's like if infrared comes along and sees methane, the methane grabs the energy out of the infrared and starts vibrating like crazy all over the place, like it just can't stop. And that is why it's these bigger, floppier molecules that absorb the energy from infrared. So if you have a planet with a little bit of methane or carbon dioxide, some of these bigger floppier molecules, then you're going to have an atmosphere that is absorbing carbon, uh, absorbing infrared, absorbing heat radiation, and it's getting hotter. If you have a planet that's all nitrogen, oxygen, or some other small, simpler, less floppy molecules, then you don't get a greenhouse effect. So anyways, that was a bit of a diversion, but I wanted to explain that, and it's important to know, to understand why it is that carbon dioxide and methane absorb heat radiation and heat up a planet, because that's a problem we're having on our planet right now, is that it, we're making it a little bit more like Venus and pumping up the radiation, pumping up, pumping up the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which is absorbing more, in, more of that heat radiation, and we don't want to become like Venus. And we don't have to. We won't become like Venus, but we don't want to heat up the Earth, because that makes it, uh, it's dangerous. And we're doing that a little bit, and now we're aware of it, and we're going to stop it. And it's partly by studying other planets and seeing what happens when you have a lot of carbon dioxide in an atmosphere that we realize, oh, we don't want to do this to our planet, so we have to change how we power our automobiles and our factories and other things and stop putting the CO2 into the atmosphere so we don't increase the greenhouse effect. Before I do the demo, maybe I'll do, uh, maybe I'll do a song. Because I'd like to, sort of halfway through the Funky Science Story Hour, just take a little break and do a, do, do a favorite song. And... Um, I wasn't sure what song to do, and I was looking around and listening to some of my music, and then I thought, oh, this, this would be a fun one to do, and it's one that you might know. It's kind of an old favorite, not just of mine, but of a lot of people. So, if you know the song, then sing along, okay? Um, and I'll just take a little song break here, and then, um, and then I'll do a, a little more science, a little more funky science. Okay, this is a song by a great
great American songwriter named Woody Guthrie, and you probably know it. This land is your land, this land is my land, from California to the New York Island, from the Redwood Forest to the New York Island. Skyway, I saw below me the Golden Valley. This land was made for you and me. Everybody, this land is your land. This land is my land. From California to the New York Island, from the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream waters, this land was made for you and me. I roamed and rambled, I followed my footsteps to the sparkling sands of her diamond walk deserts, and all around me a voice was sounding. This land was made for you and me. This land is your land, this land is my land, from California to the New York Island, from the Redwood Forest. shining and I was walking and the wheat fields waving and the dust clouds rolling as the fog was lifting and a voice was chanting this land was made for you and me this land is your land this land is my land from California to the New York Island from the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream waters. Well, this land was made for you and me. As I went walking, I saw a sign there, and on the sign it said no trespassing. But on the other side, it didn't say nothing. Oh, that side was made for you and me. And this land is your land. This land is my land. squares of the city, to the shadow of the steeple, by the relief office, I seen my people, as they stood there hungry, I stood there asking, is this land made for you and me, this land is your land, this land is my land, from California, to the New York Island, from the Redwood Forest, to the Gulf Stream waters. This land was made for you and me. Last verse. Nobody living can ever stop me as I go walking that freedom highway. Nobody living can ever make me turn back because this land was made for you and me. Everybody, this land is your land. This land is my land. California to the New York Island, from the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream waters. Oh, this land was made for you and me. Yay! I can hear all your applause coming over the internet and through the air and up through the satellites and down through the Bluetooth Wi-Fi link into my ears. It's beautiful. I love you. Thank you. All right. So a little musical interlude. Now, I want to introduce a concept that's, that's key and cool and that we're going to probably keep coming back to when we talk about other things in other episodes. So this is the concept of feedback. You've probably heard the word feedback. And feedback is one of those 
things, uh, it's, it's something that operates in so many things in life. It's your, your body is full of feedback, the world, the earth, the biosphere, life, um, society. I'll, I'll give you some examples. There's basically, you get feedback when you have two things that are interacting with each other. You have a system that has two parts. And both parts are, each part is affecting the other part. And they're either reinforcing or decreasing each other. So I'm going to um, give you my favorite example of what we call positive feedback. Positive feedback is when you have two parts of a system and they're both, excellent idea, Charles. Excellent idea on electric guitar, great idea. You have two parts of a system and each part is reinforcing the other and so they're pushing each other on and on to more and more extreme behavior. Like for example, supposing I happen to have a, an electric guitar right here. Oh, I do. And let me pick up that guitar, turn it on. And when I play the guitar, if I play it with the volume knob all the way down, you can maybe hear it a little bit. Can you hear that? It's not very loud, this electric guitar, because there's no, uh, there's no sound box resonating. We're going to talk about resonance in another episode. There's no resonance. So it's not very loud, but you can hear it. And you can hear it because the strings are vibrating. When I hit them, they're vibrating, and the vibration of the string, string is vibrating, just meaning it's shaking back and forth, and the vibration of the string is causing the air to vibrate, and vibrating air, that's a sound wave. So you can hear that a little bit just without any amplification at all, because the vibrating string is making vibrating air, which is making a sound wave, which is going into the microphone on my gizmo, and turned into electronic waves and going up through the internet and then into your gizmo and then coming out of a speaker which is vibrating, the speaker's vibrating and that's making sound waves on your end and those sound waves are vibrating and those they're going into your ear and it's shaking the little hairs in the inside of your ear and those little hairs in the inside of your ear generate little electrical impulses which go into your brain and your brain goes, oh, sound, it sounds good, I hope. Now, it's not very loud though. But what if I turn the volume up a little bit? Now it's louder, what's happening? Well, these are electronic pickups. And so the strings are vibrating, but that's moving around. And this little magnetic pickup is sensing the vibration of the string and it's turning it into an electrical signal that's vibrating at a certain frequency. And the frequency, remember we talked about light rays being different, um, d different colors based on the different wavelengths? Well, it's the same way with sound. If the string is longer, it's a lower frequency and you'll hear it as a lower note. If the string is shorter, then it's a higher frequency, a shorter note, and you'll hear it as higher frequency sound. But whatever that frequency is, it's being picked up by the electronic pickup, and then that is sending an electric signal through this wire here and the wire is going into the amplifier and then the amplifier there's some electronic circuits in there and the amplifier is taking that same signal at that frequency but it's amplifying it it's increasing the amplitude a wave has a wavelength and a frequency but it also has an amplitude the wave is bigger more powerful louder if it has more of an amplitude. So that amp is taking that same frequency, but it's making it louder. And that, that what happens is that electrical signal is moving, there's a magnet, and the magnet is in my speaker, and that electrical signal is shaking that magnet, which makes the cone of my speaker shake at that same frequency that the string is shaking at. But it's a more powerful, it's moving more air at that same frequency, and that's why it's louder. And the more I turn up the volume, the louder it is because it's moving more air and that's what you're hearing. But now that's just how an electric guitar works. But I want to talk about feedback. 
the concept is feedback. When two parts of a system are reinforcing each other. So if I turn that guitar up and turn it louder, and turn it louder, turn it louder, but if I turn it loud enough, then something really weird happens. The vibrations coming out of the speaker start to move the strings so I don't even have to pluck them to make them move. And when the vibrations coming out of the speaker move those strings, then it just starts getting louder and louder by itself because the speaker is making the strings vibrate, the signal from the strings vibrating is going into the amplifier and that's being amplified more, which is moving the magnets on the cone more, which is causing it to be louder and move the strings more. And then you get this really cool sound, which we call feedback. So now I'm gonna show you what that's like, if I can do this and make it so that you can see. Let's see, what if I sit up here near my amp? You can see that, right? <laughs> of this broadcast and that would be all we heard. Yeah, that's right, Jimi Hendrix was awesome at this. He was the master of feedback. So anyways, that's an example of positive feedback. When two parts of a system reinforce each other and then something gets, the behavior gets really extreme. There's a lot of examples of negative feedback too where um, something, uh, two parts of a system reinforce each other or, or, or dampen each other or discourage each other. Let me show you an example of a negative feedback. This is one that's sort of classic, but it's a good one. It's when you have a thermostat, okay? So imagine you're setting the thermostat in your room and you want it to be um, 72 degrees. And it's, um, it's colder than that outside. So if the heater stays off, it's the temperature in the room is going to go down, going to go down, going to go down. But you want it to be 72 degrees. So you have, um, let's say this is your heater. Um, I don't know what kind of a heater. It's a, maybe it's, call it an electric, uh, it's an electric space heater. And there, so, there, so when it's on, there's infrared radiation coming out of it. It's heating up the room. And... There's a thermometer over here, an electronic thermometer, that is measuring the temperature. And there's a circuit between the two. And you change, you do something to that circuit, you wire it in such a way that when the temperature from that thermostat gets below 72, it closes the circuit and turns on the heater. But then, and, and the, so the heater will be affecting the thermometer, and when the, when the thermometer range tells you that it's, when the thermometer senses that it's below the temperature you've set it at, it closes that circuit and turns on the heater. And then it starts to heat up and starts to heat up and starts to heat up, and then it say the thermometer says, oh, now it's 74 degrees. So what it does is it opens that circuit, which stops the electricity going to the heater and turns it off. And because of that, there's a negative feedback between the thermometer and the heater. So that the more the heater's on, the less the thermometer wants to turn the heater on. And the less the heater's on, it starts to get cold when the heater's off, then the thermometer says, oh, I want to turn you back on. That's a negative feedback between these two parts. And it will mean that the temperature in the room stays the same. 
So when you have a negative feedback, things tend to stay the same. It's stable. But when you have a positive feedback, things go out of whack. Like, let's say you made a mistake and you wired your thermostat wrong. Let's say you installed this switch backwards so that when it got hot, the heater turned on. Oh my God. Then, nothing, then, then you, did, you, you did something wrong and then there's going to have a positive feedback. And the hotter it gets, the more the heater's going to want to stay on and then the temperature in the room's going to get way too hot. So don't wire your thermostat backwards. You want a negative feedback. Now, feedback is cool because it's just, it's everywhere in life once you start, once you start um, thinking about things in that way. Like you can just think of, um, of an example from everyday life. Like I thought of one earlier today when my dog was annoying me. I love my dog. My dog Jasper, he's the best dog in the world and you're gonna meet him on one of these shows when he comes through the room. Um, but, oh, in fact I hear him. Jasper! Oh, well I don't know. Anyways, but earlier today I was sort of mad at him because I was trying to get some work done and he was barking. And I realized that if I respond to his barking in a certain way, by the way, it was my fault, bad dog daddy, because I hadn't taken him for his walk yet today, and he gets pent up when he doesn't have, get his exercise out, he's just a little young dog. But anyways, he was at the window, and he was barking and being really rambunctious, and I realized that if I act annoyed at him, and if I yell at him, or I'm just like, Jasper, be quiet, I'm trying to work, or you know, stop that, if I act annoyed at him, it just makes him a little bit more stressed out and he'll get more rambunctious and more barky and then that'll make me more annoyed at him and I'll act that way and then that's like a positive feedback where like he goes crazy and I go crazy and that's not what we want. So the opposite is a negative feedback whereas if I see Jasper getting antsy and he's barking too much instead of like acting annoyed with him if I go over to him and I say oh come on buddy you're okay and I pet him and hug him and like you know, play with him a little bit, and then get back to work. Then he's he'll he'll chill out, and him chilling out makes me chill out, and I'm less likely to um, to go aggro on him and make him aggro. And so that's that's more of a negative feedback, which makes everything kind of chill out. Or or another example I thought of: if I'm um, if I've got a paper I'm supposed to write and I'm getting later and I'm later and I'm, I'm sort of nervous and I don't really want to work on it and I'm distracting myself. The more I get, the later I am working on the paper, then the more nervous I am and then the harder it is for me to concentrate and then um, that's, just, that's a positive feedback. It's not, it's not good. You try to avoid those. Let me give you a couple quick examples of, of positive feedback that relate to planetary science because we were talking earlier about the things that make planets warmer and the things that make planets cooler. Um, and we talked about the importance of the radiation coming from the sun and how depending on how much of that radiation is reflected from the planet, the planet will heat up or cool down. Last time I talked about Venus and the fact that it would be much hotter if it wasn't for the fact that it's so cloudy and those clouds reflect most of the sun's light. Well, different kinds of surfaces heat up more or less, depending on how much light they reflect or absorb. There's a concept, I want to write down this word, because it's a cool word. Is everything, is everything backwards for you guys? That would be really annoying. I'll try to, I, I can't really write backwards, but um, the word is albedo, A-L-B-E-D-O. It's kind of a cool word, albedo. And albedo is, the um, how much light gets reflected. So if something has high albedo, it's reflecting most of the sunlight hitting it. And if something has low albedo, it's not reflecting. It's what we call it, we say it's absorbing the light and therefore it'll heat up. Now you've experienced this, um, think about uh, pavement. You're walking in, in your bare feet on a hot, uh, if, if there's a, 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 um, a road that's black, that, that's a dark black top, a tar surface, it gets very hot in the sunlight. But the lines, the white lines, if you step on the white lines, it's much less hot because 
those lines have a higher albedo, they're reflecting more light. Whereas the pavement has a lower albedo, it's absorbing the light, it heats up. So things with high albedo don't get as hot from radiation because they reflect the light rather than absorb it and heat up. Now, different surfaces have different amounts of albedo, different albedos, they absorb different amounts of light. Now picture a planet I want to tell you some examples of negative and positive feedback that affect planets. Okay, picture a planet and the sun's over here and it's beating down on this planet and heating it up. Now that planet has polar caps. Just like Earth has ice caps. You've got the Arctic up here and you've got the Antarctic down here. And other planets have ice caps too. Mars has ice caps. Although Mars, it's frozen carbon dioxide because it's so cold. But on Earth, it's frozen water. And the thing is, these caps are ice and snow, so they're much more reflective. They reflect more of the sun's light. Whereas the rest of the planet, which is ocean and land and other things, it absorbs more light. So if a planet is all ice, it's going to reflect more light and keep itself cool. Cool. If the planet is all water or all land, it's going to absorb more light and heat up. And this is where the feedback comes in. Because if you have a planet with ice caps that are big enough, then those white shiny reflective ice caps cool the planet down. So the more ice the planet has, the more light gets reflected and the cooler the planet gets. But you see what happens, that leads to a fee it can lead to a feedback because if those ice caps get big enough, if the planet gets cold enough and those ice caps get big enough, then most of the planet is white and the planet is reflecting more light into space and that means it'll get colder. It gets colder because those ice caps are reflecting so much light into space but if it gets colder then more of the water starts to freeze and the ice caps grow. And if the ice caps grow then the planet's going to get even colder because the ice is reflecting more light into space. But if it gets colder, oh my God, then more of the light, more of the water is freezing and the ice caps grow even more. It's just like Jimi Hendrix and his guitar. The feedback, it's a positive feedback. The more ice there is, the colder the planet gets. And the colder the planet gets, the more ice there is. This is something we call ice albedo feedback. And it's something that can happen to real planets. In fact, if you look at Earth history, you look at deep time, billions of years ago, there have been a few times in Earth's history when Earth has completely frozen over because of ice albedo feedback. So that seems dangerous. If the Earth completely freezes over, then why isn't it still frozen over? Because how does it get unfrozen? Because once it's frozen over, it's reflecting so much of the sun's light, it's going to stay cold. Well, this has happened in the past before, and it turns out that what saves us, what saved the Earth, what melted the ice eventually, was volcanoes. Because there are volcanoes, let's draw a volcano here on the Earth, and the volcanoes have gas coming out of them, and that gas is mostly CO2, carbon dioxide. And so, sometimes carbon dioxide is our friend. In the past, when the earth was frozen over, the volcanoes kept pumping out CO2, carbon dioxide, into the atmosphere. And that carbon dioxide, when it gets enough in the atmosphere, when there's enough, then, because of the greenhouse effect, which we talked about before, the earth heats up and it starts to melt the ice, and the ice caps get smaller, and earth gets back to normal. So. Ice albedo feedback is an example of a positive feedback. Let me give you one more feedback example. I'm going to tell you about a kind of negative feedback that can also affect plants.
So again, here's our planet. Here's the sun beating down on the earth. And this planet is mostly ocean, which sounds a lot like earth, right? Earth is mostly ocean. Now what happens to water when you leave it out in the sun? Like say this glass of water, I left it on my back deck. Well, if you came back after a sunny day, there'd be less water in it, right? Because the water evaporates. The liquid water goes into water vapor in the air. And water vapor, water molecules are H2O, which you could draw as an oxygen with two hydrogens. And remember how earlier I talked about how those big floppy molecules, triatomic molecules with three atoms, absorb infrared and are greenhouse gases? Well, guess what? Water itself, when it goes into the air and it's a vapor and it's a gas, it absorbs a lot of infrared. So, as the sun heats up the planet, those oceans start to evaporate and you get a lot of water vapor in the atmosphere, H2O in the atmosphere. But water is a greenhouse gas which can heat up the planet more. That's a positive feedback. The hotter it gets, the more water evaporates and the stronger the greenhouse is. So then why doesn't all the water just evaporate and why isn't the earth dry and hot like Venus? Because sunlight will evaporate water, water goes into the atmosphere, it heats up the planet more. It's a positive feedback. Because there's also a negative feedback. When water goes, when water vapor goes into the air, into the sky, what happens? It makes clouds. So the more water that evaporates from the ocean, as the water rises up into the atmosphere and it gets up to higher altitudes where it's colder, then the water condenses and it forms droplets, cloud droplets. So you get clouds blocking the sunlight. So where you have a lot of water evaporation, eventually you get a lot of clouds. And clouds reflect the light. So that acts as a negative feedback. The more water that evaporates, it gets hot, the water evaporates, that makes a cloud. The cloud blocks the sun and cools the ocean so that it, stop, it stops evaporating. That's a negative feedback, and that acts as a thermostat that helps to keep the Earth cool. So if it wasn't for clouds, the Earth would be a lot hotter and we'd have to worry more about water vapor heating things up. But the clouds balance that. It's one of the many amazing, beautiful ways that our planet has different forces that balance one another. Feedbacks negative feedbacks in addition to positive feedbacks that keep things stable and comfortable for life on this planet. So there's a lot more examples of negative and positive feedbacks. You can probably think of plenty yourself. I mean imagine that um, you know that, that, uh, it, that, that your mom's telling you to, to do your homework and you don't want to be told what to do. It annoys you. So the more somebody's telling you to do your homework, you, you get, make, feel defiant and you think, I'm not going to do my homework if they don't stop telling me to do my homework. <laughs> but then, of course, the more you don't do your homework, the more they're going to want to tell you to do your homework and you're going to feel more defiant and not want to do it. So that's not good. That's a positive feedback that leads to an unhappy state. So the way to break that is with a negative feedback. You think, aha! I know how to get her to stop. I, I'm, I have a brilliant idea. I know how to get her to stop telling me to do my homework. Before she even looks in my room, I'm going to start doing my homework. I'll show her. And then that breaks the positive feedback and leads to a more stable, happy state. Okay. Um, that's, uh, that's today's lesson on feedback. Uh, that's the basic concept of feedback. We're going to come back and talk more about feedback in future funky science story hours because now that you have the basic concept you'll see that it's it's just everywhere in the world positive negative feedbacks when you play your guitar when you look at the climate of the planet when you look at 
life, the cycles of life, when you look inside your own body and you ask, why is it that my body stays the same temperature when I'm healthy? It's always 98.6. Uh, you know, it's bad when it gets hotter than that or colder than that, it means I'm sick. But why does it stay basically the same temperature all the time, whether it's hot or cold, no matter what I'm wearing? And it's because there are feedbacks, feedbacks working inside your own body, where parts of your physiology are sensing the conditions and, they're, and uh, sensing what's going on in your body and they're changing other things because of feedbacks to keep everything nice and stable and healthy inside you. So feedback is everywhere. We'll come back and talk about it more in the future. I think um, we're a little bit over the hour of Funky Science Story Hour. Is there, does anybody have like a, um, a really quick, cool question they have to have? I had a couple others over here. Well, I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna save the rest of the questions for next time because we are getting long. I don't wanna keep you here. Oh, thank you, Maria. Maria says, nice beard. Yeah, this is my uh, my social distancing beard. I don't know how long I'm gonna keep it up, but I, I, it's been a little while. Um, and um, I'm going to, uh, I'm gonna go, go out. Yeah, I know, Funky Science Story Hour goes longer than an hour. That's true. It's because, you know why? Because it's not just Science Story Hour. It's Funky Science Story Hour, right? And a funky hour has more than 60 minutes in it. Everybody knows that, right? Duh. <laughs> okay. So we're going to go out, of course, with a theme song. And um, you guys can uh, sing along if you want. You can uh, do your dance moves. Uh, there's a lot of options for how to respond to the Funky Science Story Hour theme song. Um, you can sing along. Gather around my children, pull up a chair my friend Let's all get together for the story that never ends Oh how did we get here? What's inside your head? What's bluer than blue? What's redder than red? Now you know what's redder than red. It's infrared. Haha. -ha. Gather around my people, all children, young and old. Hold up a seat, pull up your feet for the greatest story ever told. Funky science story hour, cause science is knowledge and knowledge is power. Whoops, I'm going to start that part again. Funky, funky, 
science, yeah. All right, thank you guys so much. Keep it real, keep it funky. Stay safe, stay healthy. I love you all, and I will see you next week for another fantastic episode of Funky Science Story Hour.